name, amen. You may be seated. Well, let me say again how grateful we are to God for 40 years of ministry in this church. This church was founded before I was ever born, um, and many of us in this room. But to see so many faces and so many wonderful memories, and to just be filled, I can testify with gratitude for what God has done, who he has brought into our path over these many years. This is just an absolute treat, and I want to make sure that all of you know that. Well, here's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, we are going to, after our worship service here, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together, and then we are going to go next door to have uh, a, a wonderful time of fellowship, we hope. Um, there's going to make sure to check out the pictures on this wall here uh, of the Narthex uh, for some old building pictures and some other pictures. We're going to be having a slideshow running of old pictures that we found. I said this morning, I said, it's really remarkable as I look out here um, that none of you have changed in the last 20 years. Your pictures... <laughs> Your pictures look exactly the same as I see sitting out here, um, so you will rejoice in how much you little, how little you have changed over the last 20 years, uh, but we'll, we'll love to see that. We'll have some, uh, some dessert and some uh, light refreshments, and we'll have more announcements on, but we are just thrilled to be sharing this time with you tonight. I want to introduce uh, our next guest uh, this is Dave Thorson. Uh, if you have met Dave, you perhaps know that he is our co-founder. Um, really, the, 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 uh, the founding day of this church was really the work of the Lord through Dave Thorson and Roger Magnuson. And we are so delighted that Dave could be with us tonight. And Dave is going to be sharing some of the early history of the church and I am just thrilled. Uh, he, has, he has shared with me what he is going to share. And I am I'm just so blown away by God's work. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. The fact that this church lasted a month, two months, a year, five years, ten years, much less 40 years, is a testimony to the faithfulness of God. And it's that that we want to testify to tonight. So Dave, why don't you come and you share your recollections of those early days. Peter, thank you. Is a, I can't describe the joy at seeing you all here and being in this place. As I tell the backstory of the church, I have just one huge fear. You will hear uh, there was a lot of Dave and Roger in the early days, but it was God. And as I tell the story, I pray that you would look for the ways that it was God. We were just a couple of guys along for the ride. My son Sam's favorite verse is, Romans 8.28, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And yes, Sam, that's the last time I'll embarrass you today. <laughs> the story of Straight Gate was really, it started in what felt like a tragedy at the time, not knowing that God meant it for good. Roger and I became friends about five years before the church started. We were an interesting pair. He was a lawyer. I was an accounting major. He was, um, he was a master at scripture memory. I wanted to somehow get there. He had a photographic memory. I am borderline Alzheimer's. Uh, one of the things that glued us together quickly was I was asking him for tips on how I could get better at memorizing. For those of you who knew Roger, you knew that he had enormous portions of scripture memorized. And while he had a photographic memory, I want to tell you that as a close personal friend and a guy who probed his mind in this often, the reason he memorized so much was he wanted it worse than anybody I knew. He ordered his day and his life around it. 
And though I will never memorize what he did, nor come close, what a good thing to order our lives around God's word. One other thing pretty tightly held Roger and I together, and that was we were both fairly mischievous in nature. My wife and I were clearing customs last night as we came back. Uh, we had been out of the country, and we wanted to make it back for this. And uh, I commented to Roxy about Roger and I were both highly mischievous. And she said, yeah, but he grew up. <laughs> I thought, could my friend betray me? <laughs> I decided, I said, honey, we've got to ask the family if the mischievousness ever left him. I personally doubted it. Um, One of the first things that we got involved with together was uh, another long story is that the community college I was at, um, just out of sheer necessity, I'd started a Bible study there, and it grew to about 50 people. And a Bible study with 50 people is kind of like running a small church, to be honest with you. And so how do you do that? And, you know, I started figuring on this, and I thought, okay, now Roger likes to talk, so he's, he's going to give the lectures. And uh, I found four small group leaders, and I found a guy who could do um, food and, and location. And a phrase that has become dear to me all of my life, if it's worth doing, it's worth delegating. Life was now good. <laughs> and so, that actually became some of the foundation of where a lot of the bus workers came from. We, uh, Roger also had good friends in Poland. Back then, that was uh, behind the Iron Curtain, and they were very persecuted. Uh, they were university professors, at the same time evangelists, musicians, and yes, even Bible smugglers. And God managed to protect him in all of that. And Roger had the hot idea, I say that because we had hot ideas back then, that they needed an organ. And being a lawyer and knowing the government would likely confiscate it, he thought the organ should be owned by U.S. corporation. And besides, an organ should be tax deductible. We needed a nonprofit corporation. And so we formed a 501c3, which for normal people is that's the kind of corporation you make for either a school or a church. And so we thought that, that that'd be us. And so we quickly, he grabbed all the stuff together from the law firm and filling in all the blanks and we got to, what do we call it? Roger looked up and said, you know, the Puritans always like to talk about the straight gate. Not being a detail guy myself, I said, done. Thus, Straight Gate Inc. was born. And it wasn't long, and there was an organ in Poland. The church that Roger and I went to had a busing ministry. And I was a driver, and Roger was the big cheerleader. And you all know Roger is a cheerleader. He was a cheerleader of all things busing. And so we, that Bible study led us. As busing got bigger, we just recruited more people into the church. At the same time, I taught Roger how to sail. I had a 28-foot e-boat, and we were up on White Bear Lake. And so Roger bought a house on White Bear Lake, and I thought, free dock, anyone? And so my boat sailed that summer from White Bear Boat Works to the Magnuson home. And uh, we had many great times, many great early church times on the boat and at that wonderful place. The church we were going to had actually been slowly contracting, like most churches in the city back then. But what had happened was, because of all of these bus kids and because we recruited bus workers, if you didn't count the bus kids, the church was actually getting bigger and actually starting to grow financially more healthy. However, there were some difficulties in the church with that. All of a sudden, the question began to arise, we have 150 bus kids and 500 people that go to this church. How much can this busing thing grow? And I'm sorry to say that there were those who 
saw that this represented the desegregation of the church. And they left. And that did create some pressures. Now, for me, it was the purifying of the church. I thought this was perfect. I was a little more flippant back then. I didn't think through things quite as much. But it was clear that race was a bigger deal than I realized. And it was a wake-up call for me. The church really worked through, how do we slow this thing down? And finally, they told us in the busing ministry, no more canvassing. You're not allowed to go door to door and invite more people in. I mean, how are we going to handle them otherwise? And it was a legitimate question. And us bus workers were a little greedy back then. The more, the merrier. We can always buy another bus. And so the funny thing was, this was a church full of wonderful people who loved Jesus. And they taught those kids well. And guess what? When we stopped canvassing, <laughs> the numbers went up. <laughs> because Jesus was working in their heart. Jesus was working in the parents' heart. Turning off canvassing didn't solve the problem. It began to get more difficult. And finally, uh, the church leaders, church leadership had come to the conclusion that this busing thing had to somehow get curtailed. And my father is here tonight. Uh, I thought much about you, Dad. Uh, they got the deacons together and they said, we have to stop busing for the summer. And we need a unanimous deacon board vote. And they talked it back and forth and they were unanimous minus one. My father simply said, no. And I thought, what is that, what's that like to sit in the dynamic of a deacon board meeting, 11 of your friends, 11 of your peers, 11 of your close brothers, the pastor of the church is pleading for this thing, and you just say no. And I remember dad thinking about that and watching you, and I think in your mind it was just a matter of you would never do that. You would never want to stop people from hearing Jesus. There was no pressure there whatsoever. And so it was a difficult summer. That fall, um, they decided, the church leadership decided, not the congregation, it was a congregational form of government, it was decided that we would let a certain number back and the rest would go on a waiting list. Now you can imagine this created all kinds of problems because you're a bus driver and this kid comes to get on the bus and he's not on a list of the kids who can come on the bus. Are you gonna say no? None of us were. None of us were. That just. I don't know about my dad, but this just wasn't complicated. Well, the problem was, of course, they would get there and they weren't supposed to be there. What do you do now? For the most part, Sunday school teachers would be on the look for these ones who didn't belong and they'd walk up and they'd put their arm around them and say, no, no, sit by me. No, no, come to my class hoping nobody would notice. My, my wife is this marvelous rule follower, something that never occurred to Roger or I. But uh, she, she used to always go through this huge thing on a Sunday. Do I write down the number of kids I actually had? Or do I write down the number of kids I was supposed to have? <laughs> you can advise her later, it was the times. If a kid came and didn't go to a place where somebody could quickly hide them, they were sent to the library, they were allowed to color, and they sat for, for two hours, and they rode home on the bus with a note that they could be added to the waiting list. What do you do? I, I, what do you do? And so, 
The church business meetings, this had come up more than once. It was, as you might guess, quite contentious. And so uh, Roger, being Roger, had a few ploys up his sleeve. And so uh, we agreed that he was going to make an interesting proposal at the next meeting. I never liked sitting next to Roger in uh, church business meetings because we were thick as thieves and it's better to be split out so he could kind of work the room. And so Roger sat in the third row off to the right. I took the third row off to the left and an older gentleman turned to me and he said with a twinkle in his eye, I assume you gentlemen have some fireworks for tonight. <laughs> I said, we attempt not to disappoint. Uh, Roger proposed that we take the waiting list and those kids can come to church and we will bring them into the church gymnasium where Roger himself would be the teacher. What could go wrong? Uh, and we wouldn't recruit from any of the Sunday school staff, but just let them come. They can be, and, and as room opens up, they can move out of the gym to other places in the building. Well, the debate got fiery, and, and I remember one godly man standing with tears in his eyes, saying, my friends are fighting. And somebody moved to table the motion, which was not debatable. And since nobody wanted to discuss the issue, it was tabled. For Roger and I, that was uh, the last day in the church. Um, just prior to that, that I guess compounded, they brought in a church growth consultant to look at the church to make recommendations, get an outside opinion. The church consultants told us that if we had to bus in children, we should not bus in poor children, but our buses should go to the suburbs. We should be segmented not just racially, but we should be segmented economically. Now, my family having, I grew up in Edina, and I just want you to know that the fact that I was from Edina was not the best part of Rogers and my relationship. <laughs> that was a little brutal. Um, good fun, but it was brutal. My family was mad. <laughs> I mean, it was just, what, what do you mean we shouldn't be going to church with people of a different color? What do you mean with different economic strata? This is not the kingdom of God. This was common thinking back then. I, I would add that the evangelical church has, for the most part in their words, repented of this terrible idea. For the next month, uh, Roger and I kind of split up. He started looking for a church in St. Paul. I was this lost guy from Edina that didn't know what to do. I started going around to churches trying to find a church in the city that could take the kids. I even came to this church. And there were older congregations that were dying. I couldn't find anybody that I thought could take the kids. And so as we talked it over and the idea formed, why not start a Sunday school? It was a start a little church. And uh, you know, that Roger counted the cost more than I did. I'm the, I, I just start things. That's, if you look at my life, I'm just a starter of things. I don't finish anything. You just, you start it, you find people to do it, and then you go start something else. That's what I do. Companies, churches, whatever. Orphanages these days. And Roger said, we need the blessing of the deacon board to go do this. And I thought that, that showed some real wisdom. And so we came to the deacons and we asked for the blessing and they really did not know what to do with this. They said, you know, you've clearly left the church. Why do you want our permission? And, you know, we talked about it and it was still, in our, in our opinion, it was their responsibility. If they want to pass it on to us, great, we'll take the ball and run with it. And so uh, Roger and I presented, we left. My dad was there. The deacons went back and forth till midnight about what to do with this request. And they, they were just truly perplexed. And 
I remember my dad came home and he woke me up and he said, son, there is no blessing. He said, you know, in the end, they decided that you guys didn't say what you were going to teach. And without knowing the doctrine, it probably wouldn't be wise to give the kids to you guys. Now, this is a little strange because Roger, though single, taught the young marriage class. What could go wrong with that? I mean, what could go wrong with that? Anyway, uh, that, that, you know, and I taught the singing young adults class. Nobody ever asked us what we were going to teach. And so I frankly went to sleep both saddened and frankly somewhat relieved. I didn't know how we were going to pull this off. But that morning, some other deacon called the pastor and said, Pastor, I couldn't sleep all last night. Why don't we just give him the blessing and move on? And so the pastor called the other deacons, and they pulled them all. And by noon, we were given a blessing. And we were told to go ahead and start the church. So Roger and I kind of talked it over. and. It was eh, Thanksgiving-ish, and when do you start a church? And we said, you know, let's make it the first Sunday of the decade, because chances are neither of us will remember when we started if we don't do it then. <laughs> uh, details were not always his forte either. And so I don't know what we did that month. We, um, not a lot. I went to the Urbana Missions Conference, and uh, you know, we were, reality did kind of check in though. I mean, it, you know, at one level I kind of had this checklist of, let's see, experience running a church. I bet that's like running a large Bible study. Uh, check. Uh, you need church incorporation papers. Hey, Raj, what about, let's, let's dust off Straight Gate Inc. That sounds good. What's this church going to get called? It's not straight gate. It's going to be a lot of paperwork. <laughs> we don't have time for paperwork. It's the straight gate church. <laughs> you can tell God was in this, because how else could this have happened? Uh, need a bus. Well, you know, the first free when the buses broke down, we rented from the Hannes Bus Company. I called them up and said, you know, I'm, I'm one of the church bus drivers. We're starting a new church. Could we rent a bus? Oh, sure. Come on down, rent the bus. It was like 50 bucks a Sunday. It was great. So people, yeah, don't worry about people. God will bring the right ones. This is done. I mean, why would you do anything in December besides rest up? <laughs> so then came the Saturday before we were going to start. And... Uh, we ran around, we visited the kids, we said, you know, guess what? There's a new church. You get to come to church. We're going to love it. You're going to have a great time there. And they said, where's this new church? And we said, it's a surprise. <laughs> we hadn't worked that one out yet, it turns out. <laughs> Sports fans, this is Saturday. <laughs> and in my mind, we had always, I had, without thinking it through too much, I thought, you know, we're gonna get a, a, an, a party room in an apartment building, that's perfect. What I didn't think through was I lived at my folks' house in Edina and he lived at a house in White Bear Lake. And so as we were getting towards the end of the route, this very kind lady, we said, well, it's a surprise. And she looked at us kind of funny and she realized we didn't have a place. And it was M building at Cedar Scores West. And she said, I could get the party room, I bet, for tomorrow morning. We said, sold. I mean, yes, go ahead and do it. She said, well, I'll see if it's open. Turns out that Sunday morning is not a busy time for the party room in Cedar Square West. <laughs> that might have changed. So we, uh, I rented the bus. We showed up the first Sunday with 30-some kids. There was Mrs. Magnuson, Roger's mother. There was my parents, a young lady named Mary Hildreth, who I've lost track of, but she went on to be a missionary in Hong Kong. And uh, got all the kids in there, and 
I remember Roger walking up to me and he said, uh, Dave, what do we do now? <laughs> and I, I looked at him dumbfounded. I realized I hadn't really thought about this. What do we do now? Roger being Roger said, I'll go lead some songs and let's think. <laughs> Uh, pray preacher die. I mean, you know, we were Roger and I were big on arrow prayers. I mean, we were launching them all the time, and uh, Roger, of course, could pray preacher die at a moment's notice. And we got through the first Sunday, and uh, in short, straight gate one, as we called it, had occurred. We kind of labeled them like Super Bowls for the next. 10 times, because everyone was different. <laughs> it was clearly time to up our game. Roger, I think it was the next week, wrote the Straight Gate song. So we could uh, sing Straight as the Gate. Uh, meeting in party rooms, you have no musical instruments. My father um, found an accordion, I don't know where. That, accordion, right? That's the thing that goes like this. I'm not the music guy. Right? That's right, isn't it? Peter, say yes. Thank, make me feel better about the story. He figured out how to play it. It was kind of like a piano. And uh, so when we were saying off in the corner was this guy with his. <laughs> it was all we had, OK? I mean, you know. God was big. We were small. So it was clearly time to up our game. And so. I wish I could tell you more about what Roger did. Um, these recollections, I'm, I'm afraid, are mine, and we were on very different courses. We were basically trying to survive. I, uh, I started diving into some of the organizational stuff. Um, need a constitution. I read through the book of Acts twice. Kind of penned something together. Roger kind of looked at it and uh, fixed the grammar, fixed the spelling added some of the lawyerly stuff. Constitution, done. I wish I could tell you it was better than that, but that's how it happened. Um, we, uh, we, we, weren't, we knew we couldn't afford or have any full-time staff, and so that meant all the normal accoutrement had to go. There were going to be no church bulletins. Anything that looked like bureaucracy or extra work, it was gone. We were running what we would now call today a lean startup. <laughs> We were truly in startup mode. Um, things came more and more together. We kept reaching back into our bags of tricks. Uh, got some of the people went to the U of M, so quick, form a student group. They formed a student group. Student groups, by the way, on campus uh, are allowed to rent facilities. We happened to have this student group's meetings on Sunday morning at Blagan Hall. Turned out we needed the auditorium and about eight classrooms. We, uh, you know, of course, you've got to bring all the stuff every time. And so we, by now we had some buses. And you, you take the back two seats out of the buses. And then you store the stuff there. And heaven help you if you're the bus that's got the nursery and you're late. They are not happy in the nursery. It is true. Steve Peterson, who's here, will probably remember this. This is... Um, not one of my better moments, probably, but um, we, we did have that kind of normal tension between the bus workers are doing everything they can to bring them in, and the Sunday school workers are trying to do this great job of running a Sunday school. And of course, a bus shows up a little bit late, and that throws the Sunday school into a tizzy. After enough discussion of this, I wanted the problem to go away, and the, we actually ended up doing two things. But the first thing was, director of busing, you're now director of the Sunday school. Director of Sunday school, you're now director of busing. And they just switched hats. And I thought, live in each other's shoes for a little bit. But they were, very, they were so kind and gracious. I, uh, their graciousness in that chaos was unbelievable. As more people started to come, it, my wife's story really struck me. Uh, the guys at Straight Gate, especially Roger and Dave, were kind of referred to as the Bachelors to the Rapture Club. 
There was no hope for any of us, and we thought that was fine. My wife felt this real calling to come down and work in Straight Gate. And all of her friends said to her, you know, you go to Straight Gate, those guys will never get married. You will be an old maid the rest of your life. And she thought about it, and she thought, you know, they never will get married. But she thought, you know, it's more important to be where God wants you than to get married. And so uh, she came down. Later, she thought about it, and she said, you know, why was it hard to go from the church that had two women for every man to the church that had two or three men for every woman? It shouldn't have been that hard. And about three years later, you know, God called us to be single to get this church started. And then it was time to get married. And so in a very short period of time, there were no more bachelors to the rapture. I think I'm going to stay away from the first time I was sitting on a bus getting ready to go to a Bill Gothard conference, and Roger saunters onto the bus with this paralegal named Betsy, who I was told was supposed to have a good evening. Betsy, I'm going to pass on that one. Let's just say that uh, before the night was out, uh, Roger was going to walk the plank. I was quite certain of it. He was totally smitten. Um, he was gone. I'm just, you know, us accountants, right? I mean, it's, it, we, we had to call it. It was done. We, uh, there's some things to remember, though. I, it's really hard to tell the story. And while we saw God working, I just confess to you, um, we were sinners. And I wonder where we'd be. I mean, I, I look at my own, uh, as I tell my life story, I, I talk about my personal arrogance while I was here. And it wasn't just me, but me was enough. And you know, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And so, a really difficult thing. You know, we were in the middle of great blessing. I mean, we saw people come to faith like Cheryl Nelson, Modi Gidwani, Jimbo, Lisa Whitcomb. I mean, we just saw people coming to faith like I never saw in my life. And it was such a good time. But, you know, something to remember is that most organizations begin in rebellion to something. As my life has progressed, I actually now business, coach both business startups, and it seems sometimes I coach businesses who uh, still have their founder, which is um, sometimes good, sometimes not as good. And so most companies even start because somebody just, the ones that are successful start because somebody saw something that was gonna wrong and they were gonna put it right. And so there's a great temptation for bitterness in something like that. And I confess to you that sometimes I think we, we struggled with that. You know, a church, a church like any organization, right? Whatever is your greatest strength is your greatest weakness, and it was true of us. Whatever is your greatest strength leaves you um, wanting to be proud and telling everybody, like, because we forget that God is the one that's working. It's not us. And so that got forgotten. So I, I would like to give you just, having told the story, a few encouragements. And uh, the, the reason I would like to do this is, um, it's my extra credit project, Peter. Uh, in, in working with organizations that have started and helping organizations along, there are just some things that happen um, when looking back at times like this. And my first plea to you is to be yourselves. You know, Roger and I were very unique and called to do things in a unique way at a unique time. The people who are good at starting things 
aren't the best always at taking them that next journey because they're different skills, right? God enables us differently. God has enabled you differently than us. Praise be to God. If, you know, I couldn't help you right now outside of boring consulting talk. God has given you the people you need for this time. We, I have to warn organizations, don't do what your founder did. You're not them, right? Look at the mission. We want to see the city saved. Look at that mission, yes. Don't imitate us. What we did, we did for a time, for a season, for a reason. Why do we have a box in the back? Because the church consultant said, if you go to the poor, you'll always be poor, and God can't take care of you, and it's the way we translated it. Therefore, we have a box in the back. I'm not so sure that we should now, or we shouldn't have now. I, I, I have no opinion, none. I, but because we did what we did when we did it, isn't a good reason for you to do it now. Be free from us. <laughs> And I know Roger would say the same thing. Just be yourselves. Be balanced. Roger used to say that the church evangelizes, baptizes, and catechizes. We like simple things. We were better at evangelizing than catechizing. And as I look back, we, a part of catechizing is shepherding. We could get the knowledge out, but we didn't, we weren't in the city enough, we weren't in community enough. We didn't do that well. And I can't fix it, it just is. But, but think about always being balanced. You know, when we started out, we went from a church that had a busing ministry to as soon as they tell you you can't bus, what do you do? Our church will become a busing ministry that runs a church on the side. Right, because whatever you're told you can't do, you do. could have been more balanced. And the balance changes. Be humble, your greatest strengths, your greatest weakness. Look for the good. I hope you can see in all of this that God was orchestrating things long before this church because he knew this church was gonna come into being. Look for the good, look for God's hand. Look for what he's doing. When my wife and I couldn't have children, we've since adopted Sam and Sarah, but I learned a phrase that meant a lot. If I knew what God knew, I would choose what he has chosen. If I knew what God knew at first free, I would choose what he has chosen at straight gate. We were free to evangelize in a way that we couldn't. It was God's calling. It wasn't anything more or less. And the last is forgive others. You know, inside and outside the church, just due to how it started, there's a temptation of bitterness. And I would implore you to put that away. It's been said that bitterness is like drinking poison, hoping the other person will die. And you know, we're gonna have the Lord's Supper together. Do you want the cup of bitterness? Or do you want that cup? I would plead with you. Personal note to the Magnuson family, um, thank you so much. I, uh, I just had tears in my eyes thinking back 40 years ago, and I, had a, I would have given my right arm to have Roger at my side to help with this. I miss him much. I think about him almost every day. Thank you, Peter and the elders. Betsy, I hear you put in a good word for me. So. It always helps to have the mom on your side. Peter.